I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another exciting episode of Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here in my chair of infinite knowledge and answer your questions about the Second World War. Let's see. Alexander Kaiser asks, what happened to Greenland after Germany's invasion of Denmark? Following the German invasion of Denmark and Norway on April 9, 1940, it was unclear what would happen to the Danish overseas territories in the Atlantic, the Faroe Islands and Greenland. Now, the Faroe Islands were quickly occupied by the British. Greenland, however, was rapidly declared to be part of Free Denmark by the Danish ambassador to the U.S., Henrik Kaufmann. Two sheriffs were appointed to govern Greenland. They quickly rejected the Danish government under occupation and declared Greenland a self-governing territory. Copenhagen still sent governing instructions, but these were ignored. In essence, Greenland now acted as an independent nation, with Kaufmann representing it in Washington, D.C. Okay, obviously, Greenland had a critical strategic position in the North Atlantic. And this caused real fear in a local population that they were going to be invaded and occupied. And, you know, not necessarily by the Germans, but by the Norwegians. See, Norway had claimed parts of Greenland until a dispute was settled in 1933. And Norway gave up those claims. But if Greenland were to be occupied by the Allies, just like the Faroe Islands and Iceland, Free Norwegians might be stationed in Greenland. And what if those forces never leave? Well, Kaufman sought protection from American President Franklin Roosevelt, who himself had a deep personal interest in Greenland. Roosevelt had several American soldiers, let's say, discharged, who were then immediately hired by Greenland mines as guards. That didn't help much, though, for throughout 1940, the British increasingly violated Greenland's neutrality. They sailed through Greenland's territorial waters, and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill kept pressing for the establishment of a British airfield in southern Greenland. When Norwegian reconnaissance planes began flying over Greenland at the beginning of 1941, Henrik Kaufmann returned to the Americans for help. On April 9, 1941, exactly one year after the invasion of Denmark, Kaufman approved stationing of American troops in Greenland, making Greenland a de facto American protectorate. This agreement between the United States and Denmark relating to the defense of Greenland is by now known to my countrymen in Denmark. Sitting by their radios under the blackout that covers Denmark now, they will have heard the president's statement. And they will have felt grateful and encouraged when the president expressed his hope for a speedy liberation of Denmark and they heard the president's assurance that Greenland will remain Danish. In this world of broken treaties, they know the word of the American people and their government can be trusted. Roosevelt accepted responsibility for the island and the Coast Guard began patrolling in Greenland's waters. Keith Kevelson says, uh, what happened in the French colonies and mandates following the fall of France? Well, in 1940, France had a vast network of colonies stretching all across the world from North Africa to Madagascar, Middle East, Southeast Asia. When France fell, the control of all these territories came under the Vichy government headed by Philippe Pétain. Many of the governors of those colonies were pro-Pétain. Interestingly, one of the governors that welcomed a strongly authoritarian and Pétainist collaboration was the governor of Algeria, Maxime Vegan, who, as we saw, until June himself, had led the Allied defense against the Wehrmacht as supreme Allied commander during the German invasion of France. However, in August, the Guyanese French governor of Chad declared his allegiance to the Free French Forces, which started a sort of a domino effect for the French colonies in Africa. Soon, all of French Equatorial Africa was under Free French control after the Battle of Gabon. French Cameroon was taken over by Free French forces in a coup, and the general of French Somaliland fought alongside the British in the East African campaign. However, it, it wasn't everywhere that Free French takeovers were greeted with support and enthusiasm. French Morocco, um, the gigantic French West Africa, and the French West Indies still remained staunchly loyal to Pétain's Vichy government during 1940 and 1941. Okay, even though there were attempts to change this, most notably the Battle of Dakar. 
the large French colony of French Indochina still remained loyal to Pitan. However, as we saw in the weekly episodes, the Japanese occupied that colony. For the time being, this is still the situation in French Indochina. Uh, Aaron Powell asks us, what was Australia doing at the start of the war? Well, Aaron, I'm assuming you mean World War II. I mean, you didn't say which war. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> Australia had been hit hard by the Great Depression. Many places had, but Australia certainly had. And Australian Prime Minister James Scullin did not then use, like, the American approach to it, which the goal was to create employment and fresh money by spending. Instead, he signed the 1931 Premier's Plan, which sought to decrease spending by 20%, which included cuts in wages and pensions. Okay, it's debated just what effect this plan had. And Scullin, overwhelmed by the crisis and unemployment that reached 32%, was defeated in the 1931 elections. The Australian recovery initiated in 1932, but didn't really take speed until 1936, when global rearmament spearheaded a new demand for international trade from which Australia benefited. The Australian government supported the British appeasement policies uh, towards Germany in an effort to prevent a second great war. I mean, you know, they sure had plenty of memories from the first one. So when Australia entered the war on September 3rd, 1939, following the British declaration of war, it was a country not as ready for war as it had been in 1914 even. Nevertheless, they raised an Australian expeditionary force, 20,000 men, and two months later introduced conscription for home defense. Although initially slow, after the fall of France, Australian recruitment surged, with many young men joining up feeling a duty to protect England. By the end of 1940, the AEF had gone from one to four divisions, with ever more men being sent to the Middle East for training. At sea, the Australian Navy had contributed since the start of the war, with the uh, cruiser HMAS Sydney patrolling the Mediterranean. This proved eventful for that cruiser when Italy entered the war in 1940. The Sydney linked up with the Royal Navy, and by that summer's end, she had sunk three Italian ships without suffering any damage herself. Okay, that is it for today, and if you have any questions you'd like asked, don't just write them in the comments. We do go through all the comments, but that gets really confusing. Go to community.timeghost.tv. We have a forum where we can specifically look at your questions. If you would like to learn more about the Great Depression itself, you can click right here for our Between Two Wars episode about that. Please support our work on Patreon. Your support is what finances our programming. See you next time.